ask you for things knowing that even though we do not deserve them, Lord, you, got, you love to give them to us. And you love to minister to our needs, Father. So, Father, we approach you, Father, with, with, with respect, Father. We approach you, God, with boldness. But we also approach you with confidence, Father, knowing that you are God who listens to our prayers. Father, we ask, oh God, that, that your blessing will be with George, oh God, as he gets ready for that second surgery, oh God. We ask yes. that your hand will be with him, Father. Father, we pray for a healing in our brother's life, Father. We pray, oh God, that you would just, um, that you, that he could sense your love and your presence with him. Tomorrow, Father, we just ask for, your, for, for a miracle in George's life, Father. Father, we also pray for Jimmy and Michelle, Lord, as they mourn the loss of two family members, Father. Yes, Father, we ask that your that, that peace of God, oh God, that you be that you be with them, Lord. That you will let them know, God, that the, the church family is praying for them, that they're not alone, Father, and that there's someone who cares, oh Lord. So Father, we ask for this time, Father, of Bible study. We ask that your word will be open, oh God, and you will minister to us through through the preaching of your word, Father. We love your word, oh Lord. It is our daily bread, oh Lord, and we receive it tonight, Father. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Listen, at this time, we only, have, uh, we only have one class being dismissed today. That is the youth ministry, so junior high and senior high, you are dismissed at this time. All right? The rest give them a hand. Give them a hand. As, um, as they're going to their class, I just had a really quick announcement. You see these beautiful pillows behind Pastor Lewis? <laughs> yes. At our next, hold them like separate. <laughs> yes. Um, Pat made those for us. We're going to make these at our next WMs, okay? The cost is going to be $4. And you're going to get to take one home, and the other one we're going to take to our craft table at the retreat in November. Am I correct about that? Are there other designs, or is this basically the pattern we'll be using? Six different patterns, okay? So you want to sign up to uh, make these pillows. Our next meeting is the second Monday of September. If anyone knows that date real quick, shout it out. If not, we'll announce it on Sunday. The 8th, September 8th, right here at 7 o'clock. God bless you. Amen. Thanks, ladies. Come on, give him a hand. Only, only Minister Ray tries it. Yeah. Announcement, announcement. Our church is growing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for you coming for the Wednesday night uh, this Sunday morning. I, I just need to tell you that I got a, a just, you know, a powerful message, and I need you to get here Sunday morning because we're going to blow it out. You know, let the Holy Spirit move. But I wanted to share something with you. In a little while, I'm going to ask if Heidi will get me that. Is that right there? Is it right there? No, it's not. Okay, well, I'll wait. But, but let me just share that I, I'm, I made my annual phone call to Mr. Wayne Pocus. Anybody know who that is? That's the guy that gives me the Christmas trees every year. Started out with 75 Charlie Brown trees for a tax write-off. And every year it has grown. Last year we gave away 1,000. 1,000. Free. He called me a few days ago. He said, Pastor, I'll, I'll, I'll probably only be able to give you between 1000 and 1500 this year. Okay. So uh, maybe we'll need two tractor trailers. I already spoke to the city. They said, whatever you want, Pastor Jim, we're going to close all the streets off, you know, all, all the way down to the next block, get all the cars out. And, and, and this year I want to have a slamming big choir, music, you know, everything. Just, 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 and every tree is going to have this tree like salvation is a free gift. Just got to receive it. And I just think it's going to be an awesome time. Also, that Minister Ray Hernandez is going to be teaching some daytime Berean classes. For those of you that are available and want to get that institute credit level, we haven't figured out when yet, but he's going to be mentoring some of our mentor house guys. And while he's teaching them, we certainly want to give you that opportunity. If you have uh, a morning off or something like that and you want to come in and get a couple of those courses under your belt, they are at Minister... Uh, at uh, institute level, which is like about a level under a college degree level, okay? They're, they're worth about a credit and a half if you transfer them over, but, but very good courses, solid stuff, uh, five love languages, life of Christ, I mean, I mean, just all kinds. There's some on counseling and things like that that I really want to encourage you to uh, partake of, okay? Are you with me? Listen, last Sunday, it, it just seemed like it was uh, such a healing time. I noticed that my, my, my rock is still here, that my son got for me from that place in Puerto Rico. And so uh, I also noticed that he went back to college and he hasn't called since he left. My garage is clean, but he hasn't called. So I found out how to get him to call. I called and left a message on his phone and said, Timothy, I left an envelope with $50 on the, on the uh, dresser. You, you didn't get that? And so I, I think any minute now, I'm gonna, ring, it's probably going to go off, email after voicemail, he's going to be contacted. Just remind him that you, uh, you didn't get the money, and, and he's going to call right home, you know. So can you tell I miss him? You know what? You ask God about that when you send him away. Say, God, why well, I got to send my son away, man? I could release him. God will look at you. God will whisper into your ear and say, I didn't want to send mine either. But I did for you. 
I didn't want to send mine away either. You with me? Listen to me. Genesis, Genesis chapter 37. Tonight I want to kind of do a, 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 maybe a part two, if you will, of what I did on Sunday morning. Sunday morning I told you about how, you know, how there was great healing in my family because of the way that I went back and I reconciled and made things right. Everybody enjoyed that, right? And if you didn't get a copy of that, please do because I think it's healing for your heart. But tonight I wanted to entitle this message for you. And, and in the middle of September, I'm going to go into more of a discipleship expository. Now, let me teach you something. Pastors don't teach anymore like this. There are, there are three types of sermons. One is topical. One is textual. The third is, is what they call expository. And so what I love teaching is expository because it's right out of the Bible and you can circle and write notes there and just really go back and read it later and really glean a lot out of that. So I'm going to be doing some expository discipleship, very important chapters in the Bible that I want you to get under your belt, get into your heart, get into your spirit, and most of all to apply. Amen? You with me? So tonight I entitled this, How Do You Survive an Imperfect Family? <laughs> Are you with me? Anybody with me? Anybody ever been on a one-way cruise on the USS Dysfunction? I haven't. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just, just, I, I, I felt like my life, I was on a one-way cruise, man, on, and it wasn't the love boat. You know, it wasn't. It was like, you know, this ship that never, you know. So tonight, I just want to start reading from verse 1. Jacob lived in the land, uh, reading in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit of the Lord. I'm sorry. Open your Bibles or on the screen behind me. NIV, please. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed. The land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Belhah and the sons of Zephah, Zephah, his father's wives, two wives, remember that. And he brought their father a bad report about them, about his brothers, stepbrothers. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. If you have your Bible open, circle that because, because this is a major problem in families being destroyed when we begin to show favoritism. You follow me? Now, now, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. And could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you, actually, will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told this to his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you, dream you had where your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers were gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. Stop there. Let me talk to you a little bit for a moment here. You see, families have changed down the years. And many of us have been, uh, uh, somebody's got to do something. And, 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 and I can't tell you where we're going yet. I just need to tell you the story first. But I'm not going to give you a message without giving you a solution. Everybody follow me? I'm not going to expose the problem unless I tell you something we can do about it. So tonight there is a solution. But let me begin just by talking to you about families in history as far as I know. As I've watched TV shows down the years, I've seen the Cleavers. Everybody knows about them, right? I've seen the Waltons. I've seen the Ingalls on, on Little House on the Prairie. Is that right? And we always kind of thought at that point, 60s, 70s, they were the kind of the norm. You know what I mean? I ne never understood how kids in my neighborhood loved the Brady Bunch, but apparently y'all did. 
Am, am I right or wrong? I mean, am I right or wrong? I, I don't know what the fantasy was. Jan Brady got a pimple, they make brownies, you know, and, 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 and I never got it and I hated it. And I think some loved it and, and were enamored and some hated it because we just knew that would never be the reality. I'd get a pimple, they'd smack me and say, what were you doing? Yeah, what were you doing? You dirty, you insane, you got a disease, smack, you know, and, 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 and here they're making brownies and the dog gets one, you know. And, and so anyway, <laughs> during the 60s we saw the Brady Bunch, right? The Partridge family and eight is enough. Families, families then were kind of showing that blended family. You know, single parents were exposed and, and you know, at one day at a time and getting over alcoholism. Everybody remember that? Then the 80s. The 80s uh, brought in family ties. And the Cosbys led the way, didn't they? They began to expose a higher education, crossing boundaries and lines, you know, you know, removing that line of racism, showing that, uh, showing that cultures and people could, uh, could really break boundary lines and, and, and make choices, and that was a good thing. And then we came to the uh, 90s, and then we came to Roseanne and the Simpsons. Right or wrong? Roseanne and the Simpsons. And they sneak a Tim Taylor in there on you, you know, his, uh, the Taylor family. And they sneak that family in there on you, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, Malcolm in the middle and all these other little ones, you know, you know. But then, but then here we are now and, 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 and now we got the Osbournes. Come on now, you follow me? I mean, what are they basically showing? They're basically showing that down the years they've, they've been exposing that even with a leave it to beaver, you know, the brother did have a cleaver. You, you, you know, it just, just right, you know, there, there, there's, there's, there can always be something wrong in families. They've, they've kind of exposed that very lightly a little beaver told a lie, you know what I mean, and, and, and didn't do something right and they exposed that and, and, and Ward, Ward corrects him, you know, or something and, and that was the show, right? Now on the Osbournes, all his kids are having screwed up affairs, taking drugs and coming in and out of detoxes, and they're dealing with that. But the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is that families, although they've changed a lot, have not changed much down the years. Are you with me? Are you really with me? I want to tell you the story of uh, Joseph now. Are you following? Joseph is a man. He's got this uh, family where he seems to be doing okay, right? And I want to show you point number one is that Joseph's family tree is a case study in imperfection. Okay? And, 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 and my title for tonight is How to Survive an Imperfect Family. Are you following me? How many of you here ever had a dysfunction? I mean, there was stuff wrong. Only a few of us, right? And the rest that have broken arms. Okay? I mean, am I right or wrong? Right? How many of you had trouble in the family? Just stuff, stuff's gone wrong. You know I mean? It's okay. Just, just admit it. It's, it's all right. You know? I want you to notice something. Jacob is now married. I'm going to read a little bit to you because I've got some history here, but I want to go by it quickly. Jacob is married, but he's not only married, he's married two sisters, right? And they're in competition and jealousy over each other. And these two sisters have been, have been uh, very intense because one, one gets pregnant and the other one doesn't. And you remember that, that, that when uh, Jacob goes to his father-in-law, his name is Laban, if you read anything out there in Genesis. And what happens was, he wants to marry who? Anybody know what her name is? He wants to marry Rachel because Rachel's the good-looking girl, right? So his father says, you work for me seven years and I'll let you marry Rachel. You know? He works for him seven years diligently, right? Wakes up in the tent. With the ugly sister. Right or wrong? And his father says, okay, if you work another seven years, I'll let you marry them both. Uh, are you following me? The bottom line here is, is that he marries both sisters. They all live together. Then Leah is the one sister that he marries. And then Rachel. Pay attention with me now here. Leah and Rachel. Leah begins to have children. Rachel does not. Rachel's the one he wanted. Leah's the one he got stuck with. Everybody follow me here? She begins to have children. And like she's, she's like two to one and then four to none. I mean, she's at four to zip now on children, right? Rachel is the chosen one and she begins to worry about it. And she says, I got to have some kids. I got to have them. Give me children or I die. And, and basically, uh, Jacob says, it ain't my fault. I don't know what's wrong. She says, well, here, come sleep with, come sleep with uh, Bilhah. You know, sleep with my mistress. Uh, sleep with this one. Make her your mistress. She gives her another woman, her, her servant. So now he's sleeping with her, and she finally bears a couple of kids. Now this one over here is worried because she's catching up. Now it's four to two is the score. And she begins to worry. So she says, well, I'll give you my mistress, then. I'm going to get more for my side. And by the time it's said and done, folks, 
They have these 13 children, 12 brothers, right? And one daughter. The daughter gets raped. The family is messed up. Everybody's living together. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I'm not talking, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking leave it to beaver here. This is what it is at the end. So by this time, when Joseph is about 10 years old, here's the family situation. His father is a polygamist, fathering 12 sons from four different women, two who are sisters who live in the same house, as did all the brothers and all the half-brothers. His only sister has been raped in Shechem, raped, and the father did absolutely nothing. His sons went to Shechem and snuck in at night and killed all the men because they raped their little sister, and the father was a wimp and would not do anything. Everybody follow me? They're guilty of murder, they're guilty of plundering, they're guilty of thievery, gross immorality. His mother Rachel and his grandfather Isaac are dead. It's kind of messed up, isn't it? This would look like something that you would want to see on Ricky Lake. Right or wrong? Because, because what is going wrong with this family? And what I wanted to do was, I wanted to kind of show you, how, how do you survive an imperfect family? I mean, how do we survive it? How, how are we going to get through it? I just want to run a couple of things by you here. Chapter 37, verse 11, says that they were very envious. I want to show you a couple of the sins in this family. Number one, there was favoritism. Write that down someplace. There was favoritism, and we see that very clearly. It says, it says, it says uh, that, that, uh, you know, that uh, Joseph loved Rachel more than the others. He loved Joseph more than the others. I mean, I mean, very clearly, we can see favoritism is one of the things that's going to mess our families up, right or wrong. It's going to mess our family up. The second thing is envious in verse uh, 14. Can you put 14 up there? 37, 14, I believe it is. I hope I'm at the right. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and the flocks and bring me word back. And that's not it. So forget it. All right. It's, It's just another chapter. It's okay. 37, but it's okay. All right. Bottom line is, is that there's also envy in the family. I showed you in chapter 37 where they say, and they hated him, right? And they hated him. And they hated him. And he shows them this coat, and they hate him all the more. And they hate him all the more. And that just seems to be the resounding thing, you know, that, that there's this envy in the family. Anybody else ever have envy in your family? Come on, man. We're always in competition. I got to get a bigger car. I got to go refinance. I got to go sell my stuff so I can get something shinier than yours. I mean, we go through that, don't we? Sometimes it's just pressure. And the third thing that there was was that there was pride. Now listen to me. We can't take anything away from poor Joseph, but, but there must have been a level of pride there. I mean, listen to me. Uh, 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 dad, dad buys everybody their shoes, all the other brothers. He buys them shoes at, at he buys them at Kmart, right? Or he's buying their stuff at Ollie's, right? All their shoes are from Payless, right? And for the one son and for Joseph, he goes to Tommy Hilfiger. Right or wrong? He's, uh, he's buying them, I mean, a Bill Blast stuff, right? I mean, I mean, I mean that's got to make all the other 12 feel kind of bad that, you know, I mean, what's going on with us 11? You know, I mean, that he gets all these blessings and we get treated like this. So, so there was obviously this, this light pride too. Pride is an issue in family. Also, there was lying all over the family. Right or wrong? They were just lying. They're, they're just lying to it. You ever run about that in families? I mean, I mean, I know people that are just lie because they just don't know how to be honest about anything. Always lying. Is anyone with me? What am I trying to tell you here? Very clearly what we're seeing is an imperfect family. An imperfect family. And my fear is is that last week I told you about my journey. And oh man, if we could just take a little journey. but, But it dawned on me in the middle of my message that some of you will never be able to go take that journey. Some of you are never going to be able to find your roots out. Some of you are not going to be able to do that. And we really need to trust the Lord. So how do you survive? I mean, how do you survive if you can't take a flight? How do you survive if you can't go find out where you came from? How do you survive? How do you get that peace in your heart of knowing where you came from? So how do you survive an imperfect family? Are you ready? Joseph's life is a lesson on how to survive an imperfect family. And the first thing is, listen to me, after being brought up in chaos and slavery, after being sold, I would have thought, listen to me, I wouldn't mind quitting. But the first thing is don't quit. The first thing that we see in poor Joseph's life, and, and, and listen, I don't think anybody here would mind if, if Joseph copped an attitude, if he got mad at his brothers, if he had a resentment and rebellion and bitterness and rage. I don't think anybody would mind. I mean, after being treated that bad, being hated that much, almost being murdered, how many of you would agree that it's okay if he got a little attitude? Right? I mean, I mean a little attitude. I mean, it happened to me. I told you last week I threw stones. 
I didn't want anything to do with my whole culture. I thought, hey, man, if you don't love me, I don't need you either. I'm still going to survive. But we don't see any of that in Joseph's life. We don't see any of this in Joseph's life. He, uh, he just seems as if he doesn't quit. He, he doesn't use his family past as an excuse for inactivity. Amen. Write that down somewhere because, because what we're talking about is a man that served God. What we're talking about is a man that did not quit. And how many of us really, I mean, after we've been beat down, we're like, hey man, I'm not going to do nothing no more. I'm, I'm not even going to try, man. I'm going to go to Walgreens, get my medication, go home, get my remote, get a snack, and, and just sit back and chill out, man. I'm, I'm tired of trying. But the key to becoming a survivor, the key to being a survivor, and what I think God has placed to me is that you do not quit. Come on. Somebody say amen. You do not quit. I don't care what happened to me. I don't care how bad it was. I don't care what pit I was in. I don't care how much I struggled. I don't care how much they hated me. I don't care, I don't care how much I was envied. I don't care. I am not going to quit. I will not stop trying. Are you with me? He would not use it. In fact... Joseph turns up in, in chapter 39 and, and, and he's second in command of the Egyptian army. I mean, he is from a guy that you would think on face value is going to become nothing. I mean, nothing. He's, been, he's going to become a bum and a slave, right? And he becomes second in command. Why? Because he did not quit. Listen to me. Joseph shows us that even in an imperfect family, we don't have to give excuses for inactivity. And there's some of you that have stopped trying, and my concern is this, that, that, that I, I really, listen to me, I sit in these city hall meetings, and, and they're ready to unhinge everything for us because they don't want us to pull out because they know that these three, four, five hundred people that we minister to will be a vacuum if we pull on the highway and leave and go, buy our, and go build our little cathedral and become the God church now. You know, the new one, come see ours. Please come see our show. And they know that we don't want to leave. And I told them, we don't want to quit down here, but, but uh, listen to me. You need to help me out. There cannot be inactivity. We need to work. And we need to love this neighborhood. And we need to love these people. And we need to see a pocket full of potential. And I don't mean dollars and cents. I'm talking about that people have lives and that they have love. And that there's worthy people here. And that they have great things. And that we're going to win a city. Listen to me, this city, in terms of my heart mission, is going to go down in history. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it is going to do something godly. It is going to snap into gear. People are going to start buying homes. I want to start some small businesses. I want to see great things happen in this city. I want to see it be a place where people say, man, look what happened in that place. It's a nice place to live, man. It's a nice place to shop, man. I like what's going on there. I want them to see so much of Jesus that they're pressured to change, that they're pressured to say, what do you need? They say, if you don't help us change, we got to go. Anyway, number one, if you want to be a survivor, don't quit. Never use, listen, never use excuses from your past for inactivity. Are you following me? Don't use excuses for inactivity. Somebody say amen if you got that. How many have been so hurt that you just never tried anything? And people look at you and think that you're basically a dummy, but you're not. There's, there's all kind of life in you, but you're just tired of being hurt and tired of failing. Come on now, right? You're tired of failing. You're saying, you know, I, I just, I'd rather not even try. But if you want to be a survivor in an imperfect family, if you want to be a survivor in an imperfect world, you do not quit. Come on, say it. I do not quit. They can scare you at night. They can scare you at midnight. They can put you in a pit. They can hide you. They can tell you crazy. They can tell you that you're not smart. I am not going to quit. I got a hard call on me. I got a hard call on me and on you, right? Amen. Number two is that you be faithful. Number one is that I don't quit. And number two is that I be faithful. You with me? You see, some people aren't faithful. Be, uh, because of their past pain and their hurts, they're tempted, you're tempted to blame God, tempted to blame family, tempted to blame all kind of other people, and even abandon your faith. How many people have you known like that? Yeah. They'll get a little bit hurt, they'll go through a struggle in life, they'll get a little uh, uh, shaking, a little shaking of the Holy Spirit, a little bit of tribulation, and before you know it, their faith is what? It's gone. It's gone. I mean, it is absolutely shot, and they fall apart. And who could accuse Joseph now? I mean, come on, after everything that's happened to him, nobody would really accuse him if he just ran out of faith a little bit. I mean, if he got a little bit dry, would you? Nobody would say, hey, listen, come on, man, remain faithful. I'd say, hey, I, I could agree that you just kind of fell apart. How many of you have been exhausted by a few trials, man, and you just fall apart? 
But something he did that makes him a survivor was that he remained faithful. I want to show you something. In Joseph's life, every other man, and, 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 and I just thought this was so interesting that every other person in the Bible, I mean, I think of Abraham, I think of David, you know what I mean? I think of Solomon, I think of all these men, and of all these men in the history I've studied, right, I've always found a flaw. Come on now. One fell with a woman, one fell to pride, one fell to lust, one fell to money, one fell. They, they've all had all these flaws. And look at Joseph's life. You find nothing. Fourteen chapters, he never misses a beat. Is anybody listening to me? I mean, I mean, in the fourteen chapters that they discuss him, he never misses a beat. There, there, there was no, nothing wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. He dropped the ball. He failed the Lord. He didn't trust. I mean, it's never, it's like he never made a mistake. And folks, what I'm trying to tell you is his name may not resound as loudly as some, but you better put him up there with David. Because, because God had no, and you better put him up there with Abraham and all the other big leaders that you put up there because, because he never dropped the ball. What did he do? He remained faithful. Something inside that young man, I don't know if it was a six, seven, eight, nine, or ten, something inside him, the anointing of God, something told him God's got a plan. It doesn't matter what happens, doesn't matter the size of the hole, it doesn't matter where you take it, doesn't matter that they lie, doesn't matter that they cheat, doesn't matter what they did, because I am gonna remain faithful. When Potiphar's wife said it, Potiphar's wife grabbed him and said, Listen, I want you to come lay with me. He said, I, How could I do that to my master? He remained faithful. He remained faithful. And some of you are surviving families and issues and struggles and, and, and mal, malcontent and people have treated you badly, man. And, and I'm here to tell you tonight that you've got to remain faithful to God. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm not going to leave you alone. I, I, listen, I had a plan for you. I did not bring you this far to make you fall or fail. I didn't bring you to this point so I can leave you sit in the pew and fail. I didn't bring you here to just make it hang in there. Don't tell me you're hanging in nothing. Tell me the devil's trying to hang on you. Tell me he's trying to chase you and get a hold of you. Tell me that and I'll believe it better than, well, I'm hanging in there. You've got to remain faithful. God's got a greater plan. If this woman tries to get a, listen to me, she tries to get a hold of him and, and he does what? He, he says, I'm not going to do that. How could I do that to my master? And many of us do what? We used our past experiences to be able to fold up under pressure. Come on now. Oh, you know, my father was an alcoholic. So I had to have a drink. You know. My, my stepfather smacked my mom. So, you know, I don't feel like it's bad if I backhand slap a woman now and again, you know. You know, I mean, it's the way I was raised. Come on. Give me a break. Really? Give me a break. I'll break your little arm. Let me find out you're beating your woman. Let me find out you're beating your wife. Stand up, Rich. Where are you? I don't know where Rich is. Rich, stand up. There he goes. That's my Abishai. Touch your wife. He is going to touch you. Then he's going to agree. Touch it and agree. <laughs> I got a couple of things. What, man? And I got a couple of things. Dame, atrévete. Vete, tírate. Tírate. Tírate, manganzón. Anyway, you find, look, look, be, be faithful. The wonderful thing about Joseph is you, you read chapter after chapter, line after line, the baker, the jail, Potiphar's wife, the prison, starving, the, the pit, everything, and, and, and the man never misses a beat. I mean, I mean, he never fails. He, he never says, I'm tired, I'm disgusted, I hate you, God, nothing. Just he's faithful. Boom, boom, boom. Some of you need to do that. If you want to be a survivor. You got to have a faithful attitude. Number one, don't quit. But number two, you got to be faithful. Come on. Be faithful to God. He's not going to leave you. Every once in a while when the devil gets you alone and scares the living daylights out of you, go find yourself a mirror and look into it and say like this, God did not bring me this far to have me fail. It's just he, he just didn't. He just didn't. Are you follow me? He did not bring me this far to have me fail. Number three, are you ready? Number three, if you want to be a survivor... Number one is what? Come on. Don't quit, man. Don't quit. Number two is what? Come on, say this. Break the cycle. Oh, come on now. You got it. Number three is, if you want to be a survivor, and, 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 and that's when the Holy Spirit hit me. said said, I didn't even realize that that's what I was doing in my life. I was breaking the cycle. 
I was break. Listen, I was breaking the cycle. And if you want to be a survivor, if, if, if listen to me, we got our kids are back at college now, and some of our kids from church are, are now at college. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I mean, kids at college, our kids at college. Is that amaz- Does that amaze anyone? Some others are going to college. Now. Does that amaze anybody? I mean, we're breaking the cycle. They've, they've broken the cycle. This place is going to change. And we're going to have to knock that wall down and build it out that way. Knock some houses down and build our parking lot. I still don't want to leave. I don't mind if we modify it and make it look pretty, but I don't want to leave. This is, this is our city. They can leave if they want. Go, go to the highway. Minister to the cornfields. I'm serious. Everyone got a big temple. Big, big temple what? Plant another church. Don't be greedy. There's somebody else pastor. I'm in trouble, right? Turn that tape off. I think all pastors who build big churches are wonderful men and women of God, and I really want to encourage them that they make the cathedral even bigger and larger, and I think that's a wonderful thing. And I'm a hypocrite and a liar, and that's not, not true at all. You should be building churches. The fruit of an apple tree is what? The fruit of an apple tree is what? An apple tree, not an apple. You build another one, okay? Anyway. You break the cycle. Joseph's family was known for what? Anybody know what the word is? Deceit. Remember? His father Jacob deceived Isaac just to take his birthright. Do you remember that? Deceit. Look at this. Look at this. Just to steal Esau's birthright. Joseph's grandfather, his grandfather, it's in the family. Laban deceived Jacob into marrying uh, Leah first and then Rachel. Deceit. Are you following me? Yeah. Is anyone following me? I mean, are you really picking up on it? Right? Later on, Jacob dope fiends his own father-in-law and does the whole sheep coloring thing, right? And he deceives him. Are you following me? Is anyone following me yet? Look at this family history. Look at what's going on there, right? His brothers, look, that was four I just gave you. I mean, I could go more. Now, number five, his brothers deceive his father and take his coat of many colors and dip it in some wild animal blood and say he was killed. Number five, deceiving. Are you following me? The family was always lying, weren't they? Deception. They were always lying. Deception and manipulating. And folks... Some of us may think, I know you people, I know your family, I know who y'all used to be in the neighborhood, I know what you did, and they'll profile you and put you in a box. And you got to say, don't put me in that box. You see, I came to break the cycle. Come on, you follow me? I, I, listen to me, listen to me. I didn't come to be like my family. I came, listen, I may have their image, but I came to break the cycle. You know, I'm not taking that generational curse with me. I'm not taking that garbage into my kids. I'm not taking that stuff. I don't care if they lied. I don't care if they had incest. I don't care if they had rape. I don't care what they had. I don't care what they had. I don't have to bring that here with me. And, and, And if I want to be a survivor, I've got to break the cycle. And some of you are right there right now. Some of you are right there right now. All you're doing, if you look back, you find the person you hate the most. And look in the mirror 20 years later, you became them. Come on now. I hate my mom. I'm never going to be like my mom. Look in the mirror. <laughs> it's mom. But it's you. <laughs> I'm serious, right? Anybody follow me? Find that man you hated, gentlemen. Find that man. I'm never going to be like that. Never going to be like my stepfather. And look in the mirror one day. It's you. you we become them. Anybody follow me? I'm not going to be like my sister. Yeah? Why is everybody pregnant? Because we all just follow. Listen, I'm not trying to get on nobody's case. It is what it is. We do what we learn. We do what we're modeling and we do what we see around us and we follow through. Why do you think there's a family of junkies? Come on now. Why, why do you think there's a family of drug addicts? Huh? Because they just do what each other does. Why do you think there's a community that's all screwed up, all thinking the same thing? Because we do what we see and we become it. But somebody's got to stand up and say, you know, I'm breaking this curse. 
I'm not going to be a deceiver. I'm not going to be a Jacob. I'm not going to be a supplanter. I'm not going to be a liar. I'm not going to be a thief. I'm not going to be a murderer. I'm not going to be an under, I'm not going to be an adulterer. I'm not going to, I'm going to break the cycle. And, and listen, and that may mean, that may mean that for some momentary time, I may have to stand alone and stand alone sometimes is lonely. But if you go back to point two, it says, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says, if you try, listen, I'm not going to leave you. I'm with you. And many of us, it's the fear. You know what? In, in, in years of counseling, I've seen people, I counsel them, and, and man, and they've got this great potential, and you get them right to the pinnacle of success, and they, and they do a nose kamikaze dive and destroy their life. Are you following me? We refuse to succeed because, because there's this fear factor of standing alone for something. I'll tell you something. It is the most awesome thing in the world to know that I come from a family of drug addicts. And it is the most awesome thing in the world to be able to look you in the eye, anyone that wants to, and look you right in the eye and say, I am not hiding behind the cross, but I stand in front of the cross. I don't need to hide behind Jesus. I stand for Jesus. And I know that God has placed in me a power to stand upright and break the cycle of lying, of cheating, of murder, of, 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 of all the bigotry and hatred in my family. And you need to do the same thing. Because some of you are right there. And we need to break that cycle. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of being the way it was. I'm tired of it. And, and people can pick me out. Not even by, by the way I look, but by the way I act. I guess I know who you belong to. I used to tell people around here, they say, yeah, whose child are you? They say, yeah, don't tell me, I know. Right or wrong, Pastor Lewis? I know whose child that is. I don't even need to see the parent. I know exactly whose child is. Not, not because they look, because they act the same. They act the same as all the others. And some, come on, man. Some of us got, somebody's got to break the cycle. And there's some people in bondage in your life. There's some of your children. There's some of your spouses. And, and, and you need to break the cycle and say, in the name of Jesus, I pray that this cycle be broken. In the name of Jesus, I pray the power of God. In the name of Jesus, I pray that this be gone. That, that this generational curse, that this, that this habit that has infested, that this habit that has infested this family, these generations, that, this, that, that it just be gone. And you rebuke it. And you pray every day and say, I will not bow to that. I don't care if my family is familiar with it. I don't care if we do it well. I ain't doing it no more. I ain't doing it no more. You with me? Joseph was a man from a family of liars. Yet it says he had great integrity. Second in command. It says, and Potiphar placed him in his house and, and, and he did all and above that his attendant told him to do. The man's wife comes to him. You know, he's a young man at this point, you know. And she hits on the young man and he says, How could I do that to my master? Come on, you, know, you come from a line of deceivers, man. It's a, man, it's an older woman. She's going to take care of you. You could, you, know, you could be the man, have it going. Man, man, you can have a camel Lexus, you know, and, and, and just come on. What are you doing? You know, you can make a little compromise here. Do it in the name of the family. But you see what the man said, I'm breaking the cycle. I'm, come on now, somebody, is anybody with me tonight? I'm breaking the cycle. Come on, how, how many of you caught in a cycle? Come on now, just be honest, man. Be, be honest. I was too. You just caught in some, this is the way the family did. And sometimes it's not what you do, it's the way you think. It's your method of thinking. You just always, you just negative, negative, negative. And you so negative, we put you in a dark room that you develop. Right or wrong? I'm telling you. Be, because, come on, anybody follow me? Come on, how many of you, it's, it's negative, it's going to be, but, oh, I don't know how I'm going to, just, just you, like, always, you, uh, like, got a constant frown, and uh, you're waiting on the next crisis. I mean, you get paid, and you're scared that, that, that something's got to happen on your way home, and you're going to die. Uh, right or wrong? It's a cycle of thinking, folks. It's a mental disposition, it's an attitude, we've got to break that. If you want to be a survivor, you got to learn how to get on your knees and pray that and say, though this is what I learned, I will not, not in my own strength, but by the power of God, not by my, not by strength, but by the spirit of the Lord. I'm going to cut beyond this and I'm going to cut a whole new generation and my children may never know about that. Lest I tell them. Lest I tell them. You with me? Number four. What's number one? Don't quit. Number two. Remain faithful. Number three, 
You got to break that cycle. They may have been lies, but I'm a man of integrity. Joseph said, I may have come from that, but no, I'm not going to touch your woman. No, I may have come from that, but you can trust me with all your silos. Yes, you can, Mr. Farrell, and I will take care of it all. Second in command, you don't get that being a bum. Right or wrong? Number four, you got to trust God. You with me? Potiphar's wife didn't like it when she accused him. And what she didn't like was that he didn't take, take the offer. Right or wrong? He didn't take the offer. And she didn't like it. So what did she do? He raped me. He raped me. He was falsely. Uh, stay with me now. Come on. Don't disconnect. He was falsely accused. Right? How many of you have been falsely accused? Don't you feel like it, it's, it's hard to trust again? It's hard to try again. I've been burnt once before, right? You know what I mean? And they, they burnt you. They, they besmirched your name. They, they messed up with your name. But what, what little we have is our name. And when they torture that, you feel like you just don't want to be bothered anymore. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But take a look at what it says. It, 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 it says uh, very clearly, 39, 2 and 39, 21. Genesis 39, 2 and 39, 21. Put that on the screen for me, please. 39, 2. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. Now listen to me. This is a part of her situation. This is after he's already, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, like he's headed for prison. I mean, he's being accused. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and lived in the house of the Egyptian master. Are you following me? And then 39, next verse, where is it? 21, please. 21. The Lord was with him. There again, you follow me? He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Are you following me? I mean, here he's in jail. He's in jail. And what? The Lord was with him. He's in temptation. And he's got to make a choice of integrity. And the Lord was with him. And the Lord made him prosper in all he did. And folks, this comes from, from number four. You've got to trust God. Somebody say amen if you follow me. I mean, I know people that will work hard and they won't quit and they're overachievers and they'll excel and they'll try to do more and above and beyond. But it's not just about that. It's about trusting God. God's got something for me to do. God's got a call on my life. And some of you may be out there and this is where I wanted to talk to you today. You see, some of you may be thinking, well, you know, God repaired me, but he can't use me. Are you following me? God can fix me. But he can't use me. God can take away my affliction, my addiction, my disease, my, my attitudes. But he can't use me. God can just, God can make me clean. And so here I am, a restored vessel. And so, you know, I'm hiding in church because this is where I'll stay safe. If you're hiding in here, you better get your stuff right. I'm telling you, I don't need you doing that. I need you to be full of the Holy Spirit so that, so that when anything tries to crack you or shake you, the only thing that comes out is living water. It's living water. And then the Lord himself restores again. Are you following me? But that only comes if we trust God. That only comes if we say, hey, listen, listen. The Lord is with me. I know what you've done. Listen to me. You falsely accused me. They lied about me. And how many of us, when somebody lies about us, we want to go get in the flesh and, oh boy, if I could just backslide 15 minutes, I'll square all this away. Right or wrong? I just, just let me just... You know, lose my salvation. Take out the shot. We're going to hook this all up. We'll, we'll come back and, and next week we'll all be at the altar to make this right and go back business. But, but it's not about that. You see, you see, it's not about let me jump in the flesh and fix it. It's about can I trust God in the midst of a storm? Can I trust God when the chips are down? Can I trust God when I'm in the middle of a valley? Can I trust God when I'm in the pit? Can I trust God when I'm lonely? Can I trust God when I'm being tempted? Can I trust God when I'm in fear? Can I trust God when I've been accused? And I know that I know that I never, and I'm thinking, how much has got to happen to me? I mean, they tried to kill me. They tried to hurt me. I come from a family of liars. They messed me up. We all lived together. They raped my sister. My mother died. My grandfather lied to my father. I mean, what more has got to happen to me? I mean, you'd want to quit. How many people have just quit? You know, how many don't we know that have left God? I'm on my own again. You see, they're not a survivor. They walked away from the key principle of being a survivor. And that's that I will trust God 
No matter what happens, Job said, he said, though you slay me, yet will I serve you. Though you slay me, you can kill me, and I would still, you can knock me down, knock me out, hurt me, do what you want. And if I have one breath, I will say, Jesus, huh, Jesus is my God, he is my Lord. He said, though you slay me, I will yet serve you. Some of you need to trust in God. We spend our time, I see people, they, they swing in the pendulum. Now, everybody wants to be a prophet. They want to give you a word. They, I got a word. I got a word for you to repent and shut up. Amen. You know, repent, you know. Uh, but, uh, but this is it. Now, th- this is the pendulum. Everybody's swinging this way. And they're, they, they, they just, you know, faith all over and everything. And, and they're doing nothing. God is trying to speak. to say, trust me. Would you trust me? I read a, ni- a 19th century writer. He said, the church today. He's talking about 1915. He said, the church today is so in love with loving Jesus that they act more like a carnal lover coming to see someone they're coming to fornicate with than reverencing God. And, and, and man, I mean, is that kind of like what you see now? Everybody was, you know, I mean, everyone was jumping, just, just everybody, let's, let's dance and let's just, just you know, wave banners and, and, and just act. And I know you're goofing on me. I know you won't laugh at me now because you're trying to respect me. But, but you know, I look weird. But, but my point is, is that we're so, you know, so we got such a familiar spirit with God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We got a familiarity with God. Man, it's like this love thing. That we, oh, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. So why don't you respect me? If you love me so much, why don't you trust me? It's amazing how you love me in the middle of a worship service when everything is booming and jamming and all the music and sound is up and you love me. But the minute that one trial comes your way, you fall apart. There's a school of thinking now. Everything is the devil. They, they've swung the pendulum this way. Everything is the devil. I rebuke him. I saw the devil in this and the devil was in that and the devil was in this and that. They're, they're, they're focusing so much on the devil. You know, sometimes it ain't the devil that puts you through that trial. Sometimes it's God. Didn't it say, and the Lord was with him? Did it say, and the devil was with him? It said, the Lord was with him. Sometimes that little wilderness experience that you're going through, God is just taking you through a Joseph walk, saying, will you trust me when the chips are down? I know you do good at the wedding, but can you dance at the funeral? Can you celebrate at the funeral? You ready? And number five, I'll let you go now. You're tired of me now. <laughs> Just because you come from an imperfect background doesn't mean that the Lord has forgotten you. Trust God. He knows where you are. You in a little prison you're on right now? Trust God. Are you with me? Number five, be useful wherever you are. Are you with me? What's number one? Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Wherever you are. In prison. We end the story of Joseph surviving an imperfect family. In pri- Oh, that's why I'm thinking, man, they're hot again today. They, they got it on the screen behind me, don't they? I love my team up there. I'll tell you, I got, the, I got a cracked, t- not cracked cocaine, but a cracked team up there. Cracked, yeah, cracked team. They know how to run that stuff, man. You're thinking ahead of me there. I, I didn't know you could just do the outline thing. That's good. Makes me think they're really like, I'm thinking, man, they are like on this, man. They're on it. <laughs> Number five, be useful wherever you are. Try to remember that cracked vessel thing I told you. The broken pot. Right? And how God puts you back together, but the inside is still kind of empty. Come on now. You might feel what I'm talking about. Oh, I'm back together. I'm whole. Look at me. I'm in church. I'm so tired on. But inside, we're still empty, aren't we? We still feel useless. But you got to be useful wherever you are. What am I trying to tell you this for? Because Joseph, in prison, he's being useful. I mean, he's fine in prison. He said, hey, uh, listen, uh, am I in jail? <laughs> then I'm going to work for the warden. <laughs> right or wrong? Amen. If I'm going to be in jail, I'm starting the prison ministry. Right, right or wrong? Are you following me? Right or wrong? Right? When they let me out of here and they find out that I'm a man that's got some wisdom, I'm going to interpret dreams. And, and before you know it, I'm, I'm going to let them know that this little Jewish boy is an accountant. And I can take care of the whole famine thing. Uh, is, is anyone following me? 
But how many of you in the midst of your struggle, you feel like you're useless? Come on now. And this is where the devil, there's a difference between the word conviction and condemnation. Conviction means that you feel sorrow for your sin. Condemnation means that you've been rendered useless. And so what happens is, is that when we, we have done something wrong or we find ourselves in what looks like, come on now, looks like, let me say it again, looks like an ungodly situation, we become useless. And God is saying, you got to be useful wherever I put you because, because if you're gonna, if you're gonna praise me in the prison, then I'm gonna let you out. If you're going to praise me in the prison, I'm going to let you out. If you're going to praise me in the bad times, you got some good times coming. Are you following me? you got to be useful wherever you are. It don't matter where God puts you. It could be a sickness. It could be a disease. It could be a hurt. It could be a pain. It could be loneliness. It could be so. Wherever it is, you better find something to do for the Lord and begin to praise Him. And you better put your praise on for Jesus and start to worship Him. Are you ready? Throw the five up, please, now. Listen, Bible study is always very calm, so I promise Sunday I'll be a little bit more excited. Okay? Because the Bible study, you want to tone this down a little bit. Just kind of be a little calmer. Don't quit. Don't use your family's past for an excuse for an activity. Don't you dare... Well, you know, you know, I was hurt, so that's why I don't do nothing, Pastor. Don't be, don't be giving me no excuses. All right? Number two, be faithful. Don't be tempted to abandon God. Don't be tempted to abandon. Be faithful. Just be faithful. God knows where you are. He's not going to leave you. Number three, break the cycle. Joseph's family was known for deceit, and yet Joseph, not a bad word in 14 chapters, is said about not, not one bad word. Nothing. Even though he put that coat of colors on and paraded in front of his brother, God never even calls him proud. He just knew his calling was going to suffer for it. That's all. Right or wrong, that's all. God never even called him proud. Number four, trust God. The Lord is with you in your trials. Trust God. And then finally, be useful wherever you are. Wherever you are. Whatever your hand finds to do, do that as unto the Lord. All things work to the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Let's bow in prayer, please. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, you've called us. You've called us, set us apart, separated us, God. You are so good, Lord God. We we just, I don't want to begin to preach no cheap gospel in this house or in this city. We need to be people of truth. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that tonight, maybe some people needed to hear this and, 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 and they wrote some notes down and they were at the point of quitting. And if they were, I just, I just, uh, while every head is bowed, would you raise your hand if you've been getting ready to quit for something? Some reason. Be honest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. You can put your hands down there. Those are about eight or nine hands. Anybody here that, that because of the struggles in your life, you have just been so exhausted that, that you've almost been tempted just, just, to, I mean, just to blame God and just to become unfaithful. I'm not saying that you're going out and going to go do gross sin, but you just thought, you know, come on, what's it matter? Come on, anybody, raise your hand. Thank you. That's a whole bunch of hands. Thank you. Put your hands down. Number three. Anybody realize that you're caught in a cycle? <laughs> you raised your hand even before I told you. You're caught in a cycle and you need to break it. Come on. Come on now. Right? And you need to break it. You need to break it. And listen. And listen. And everybody keep your heads down. And that may be a little fearful time for a little while. Change is, change is hard for all of us. Change is a very difficult thing. You know? and, and But, you know, what you need to remember is, is that right now when I ask that question, about 20 people raise their hand. That should obviously tell us I'm not alone. I'm not alone, you know, and I'm, I'm in a house of people that are about to change. And, and number four, how many of you sometimes have trouble trusting God when you're in, in trials? Come on. God, thank you. Come on, man. You just feel like, man, what's going on? Why, why would God let this happen to us? I mean, why are we going through this garbage again, you know? Don't people ever give us our respect? How could they treat us bad? How could they mistrust us? How could they accuse us? After all we've done, how could they treat us like that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Say amen, or me, or my, or ouch. And finally, how many of you would promise me tonight, keep your heads bowed, that you would whisper this, let me whisper this to you as your pastor. You are useful wherever you are. Don't matter if you're just coming out of a bad sin and you're making it right. You're useful. It don't matter where you are. It don't matter where you're stuck. It don't matter your circumstance. You are useful. 
How many of you say, Pastor Jim, I want to be useful from here on in wherever I am? Raise your hand. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Put your hands down, please. Father in heaven, you've seen our hands. Just all over this room for every question. You see our responses, God. Father, we need you, Lord. The key to all of this is not us and our power to choose, but our power to trust you, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So I pray in the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you administer to these people and to myself, Father, me too, as a shepherd. And, and Father, I pray that you would make us strong for the race. Make us consistent. Make us stable. Make us powerful in you, trusting in you, stable in you, trusting in you. I thank you, Father. May your blessing rest upon your people tonight. Give them a great, wonderful, and a powerful week of breaking cycles. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Bless you. Have a